Welcome to another video. You've got Mr. Everything English. And today, guys, we are looking at question number five. This is the question that is the most requested, the most talked about, and the most controversial. Everyone has an opinion on question five. It's the 40 marker. Now, in this video, guys, we're going to go over everything that you need for question five. From ground minus 10 all the way to the rooftop. We're going to cover everything you need for this question five. So by the time this video finishes, I truly hope, number one, you're more confident with your question five. But two, you are fully aware of what you have to do in your exam on Monday. So guys, let's begin by going over the actual question itself and the bones of this question. Now guys, paper one, question number five. What is the question? What is it worth? And how do we work it? The entire question, guys, is worth 40 marks. And these 40 marks are spread over 45 minutes because that is how much time you have for this question. And for those of you doing the AQA exam board, they advise that you should be writing two to three sides for this question. Now, what is this question, guys? This question is you essentially talking about a picture or you writing a story. That is essentially what you have to be doing for this question. And it's been coined, it's been coined as the question that is about creative writing. Now, what you see on the board, guys, what you see on the board, this is the basic outline of the question. 40 marks, 45 minutes, two to three sides, and you pick either the picture or you pick a story. And guys, I should have said that this is 50% of the entire paper. Now off the bat, there's one thing that I want to talk about, and that is this idea of creativity. And it's been championed as the creative writing question. And when we teach as English teachers, when we teach creative writing, what do we say? We say, think outside of the box. But unfortunately, guys, this question is not a creative writing question. It's a con, it's a lie, it's an absolute mockery. Why is it not creative writing? Because we're not in year seven and we're, new, and we're not in year eight, nor are we in year five or year six. When we are in those years and we do creative writing, we say, think out of the box. Crazy characters, crazy settings, crazy plot. Show me your imagination. But unfortunately, it pains me to say this, but as you get older, and as you get into year 10, and then into year 11, and you approach a GCSE exam, this box that you're told to think outside of, you now need to come back into the box, put sellotape all around the box, and make sure your answer fits the box. Now, what's this box that I'm talking about? This is the mark scheme. This is the mark scheme when it comes to question number five. And we're gonna go over the mark scheme. And if you can find any words in the mark scheme that mark you on your creativity, then I rest my case, I lose. And anybody who says it's creative writing wins. But guys, why am I so big on this point? I'm so big on this point because I meet so many students who get lost in their plot because they've been told that this is creative writing. So they'll go and create the most adventurous plot with the most unique character, with a beautiful setting. Guys, we're not doing Harry Potter. We're not rewriting Lord of the Rings. You've got 45 minutes to gain 40 marks. You are sitting a GCSE exam. That's the first thing I need you all to understand. Switch your mindset. We're in an exam. And what does every exam have? Every exam has a set criteria. You must do one, two, three, four, to get 40 marks. You could be as creative as you want, but unfortunately, if it's not in the mark scheme, why are you trying so hard to think of the most amazing plot? So the first thing I want us to do, guys, is us to go over the mark scheme. Because for us to understand this question, we have to understand all this loveliness that has been published by AQA. So the total marks are out of 40. These this 40 is divided into two, one for 24 and one for 16. 
essentially guys 24 is for your content and organization and your 16 is for your spag let's go over the first 24 to get 24 out of 24 or even 22 or 23 so to get a top band for this part of the answer your communication now what does it mean by communication It's talking about your writing because in your exam you will be communicating through writing you're not going to dance you are going to write a piece of writing and this writing has to be convincing and this writing has to be compelling meaning your writing has to be interesting and then this bullet point over here says guys you must match the purpose meaning you must make sure you answer the question now i want to talk about these three things first and foremost Number one, make sure you match the purpose. Make sure you answer the question. Easy. Do that. Of course, we're going to do that. The top two, convincing and compelling. The convincing um, phrase. I want you guys to understand one thing. This mark scheme is the exact same mark scheme for paper one, question five, and paper two, question five. So the word convincing could be implying that your work must be persuasive. This, impl this applies more to paper two. But then we have the word compelling. And the word compelling means interesting. That your work needs to be interesting. But there's a problem, don't you guys think? Imagine you've got five different examiners. One of them loves watching, I don't know, watching Fast and Furious. The other one, he loves Harry Potter. The third one, he loves watching gangster movies. And the other two, they love their own interests. If interesting meant how exciting your story is to read, surely you're at the mercy of the examiner who ends up marking your work. When the exam board talk about interest, they don't talk about interest in the sense of, is your work exciting? Is your work making the examiner go, wow, this is amazing. When they talk about compelling, they talk about what? They talk about everything down here. They talk about your command of language. That is how you make your work interesting. It's the next four bullet points that make your work compelling. So just want to make this clear, guys. Compelling means interesting. But interesting in this sense is talking about is your language interesting? Because you're sitting an English language exam. It's not talking about how amazing your story is because that is very subjective depending upon who the examiner is. So guys, those are the first two bullet points. Now these two bullet points, I call them common sense. I call them common sense because you should be doing them regardless. You should be answering the question and you should be using interesting language the whole way through. But when I say language, what do I mean? More importantly, what does the exam board mean? Let's look at the third bullet point and this is where things get interesting and this is where things get important. They say you must use extensive, ambitious vocabulary. Now, what does the word extensive mean? The word extensive essentially means you must use a lot of ambitious words. What does ambitious mean? Ambitious means really, really big. Yeah? Use big vocabulary. Don't say sad, say melancholy. Melancholy. Don't say angry, say indignant. Use big words. And we're going to cover all of this later. But look at the next word. That by itself is not enough. Using big words by itself is not enough. You must use big words with, with what? With sustained crafting of language devices. Now, what does the word sustained mean? It means you must keep it up and crafting looks at the quality of your devices now let's pause here for one second guys let's pause here for one second remember this is the top band we're looking at 22 to 24 out of 24. the example is saying to you that in your story they haven't said be be creative they haven't said have an amazing character with an amazing setting what have they said they have said that in an English language, 4E mark answer, you must have a lot of big words with, at the same time, you must have language devices. But these language devices must be sustained. 
You must keep it up the entire essay. Why is that important? Because I know, you know, and they know, the biggest weakness of students is what? Maintaining, sustaining the use of language devices. Everyone can write one amazing paragraph. Do it twice, do it three times, do it four times, do it five times. And now we're talking. Now you're going to get a grade nine. You must keep this up throughout the entire essay. But doing language devices by itself isn't going to get you a top band because they must be crafted. What does crafting mean? It looks at the quality of your language devices. If you're going to keep saying that the leaves were waving in the wind and that he ran like a cheetah. Yes, you've used personification and yes, you've used a simile. But is that a good quality of a simile? No, it's terrible. So you can't just get away with using language devices. You're looking at the quality of your language devices. For example, onomatopoeia. What is everyone's favorite onomatopoeia? Boom. It's like the bomb blast happening all over the essay. Why not use other onomatopoeias? Creaked is a much better. Crunch is a much better onomatopoeia. But the first thing I want you guys to be aware of is that the exam board are telling us, not me, the exam board are telling us that you must have lots of big words with a sustained use of good language devices. That is the first thing that we care about. Then we move on to the next thing. What do they want after that? After that, guys, they want the use of structural features. Now, what do they mean when they say structural features? We're looking at long paragraph, short paragraph, dialogue, list, repetition, cyclical structure. I will give you all of this later. Later, we're going to go over and we're going to plan all of this out. But for now, I'm giving you the justification as to why we need this. Structural features. It doesn't mean things like zooming in and zooming out and shifting focus. Why? There are certain structural features that you will do without even thinking about it. You're all going to zoom in. You're all going to zoom out. You're all going to shift the focus. But then there's some that you must consciously make an effort to do. And that is what we must include inside our writing. And then, guys, it repeats the first part. It talks about how your writing must be interesting. And then it says how you must link your paragraphs. Everything must make sense. So that's the first thing that you must do. Oops, guys, that is the first thing that you must do to get a mark out of 24. After you've been marked on this, then you're marked out of 16. Now, 24 plus 16 is 40. So the second thing you must do is as follows. Your sentence demarcation must be consistently secure. What does that mean? Sounds so fancy, guys. It sounds so fancy. This must be super duper high end stuff. All this means is your use of full stops, your use of exclamation marks, your use of question marks. Anything that is used to signify the ending of a sentence must be done accurately. That is, guys, common sense. You're in year 11. You're sitting a GCSE exam. Of course, we're going to try our best to make sure that we are ending sentences appropriately. Then guys, I'm still waiting by the way for creative writing. I'm still waiting for the bullet point that says that our writing to get a grade nine has to be creative. Um, but I'm sure it's coming somewhere. All right guys, then we have a range of punctuation. We need to include a range of punctuation. What does that mean? I tell all of my year 11s at this point in your year, Using commas and full stops is the least we are expected to do. If you've made it this far in your, in your student life and you are a couple of days out of your English GCSE, commas and full stops, you must use them no matter what. But the exam board is saying, give me more. Give me a range of punctuation. Exclamation mark, question mark, speech mark, brackets, colon, semicolon. Use all that in your writing. We're going to cover that later in more detail. Then, the third bullet point, guys. Sentence forms. We must have long and short. That is sufficient. That is enough. We must look at sentence forms. Then, guys, the fourth bullet point. Please use standard English. All that means is try to avoid using unnecessary slang or street talk. I'll give you an example, guys. I've marked 
um, when I used to be an, ex an examiner, I used to mark question fives. And I used to literally mark stories where children would say, lol. They would write LOL in their story. Um, guys, don't do that. Don't say bro. Don't say fam. Keep it simple. Keep it clean. Write in full English. And then, guys, of course, of course, of course, we are looking to have accuracy in spelling. Again, of course, we're not going to make mistakes. But there's something important here. It says accuracy in spelling, including the big words. What's my rule? I always say this. We do not be a hero in the exam. You do not try to use brand new words in your exam. Before you walk into your exam, to be honest with you guys, by the end of this video, I will give you all the words you need. But we do not go into our exam on the day and think of new words then. We're not going to be a hero. If you're not sure of how to spell a word in your exam, think of a different word. Because spelling is important and spelling will make us lose marks. And then guys, the last bullet point, which is the super important bullet point that keeps coming up. They ask you again to use a lot of big words. That's the mark scheme. It's not my mark scheme. It's the mark scheme that is published by the exam board. And it's the mark scheme that examiners use to mark your work. I didn't see creative writing. Maybe I missed it, but I didn't see it. Do not get lost, guys. It's a bunch of fake news and the fake news has to stop. You are sitting a English language exam. What's the one thing that the mark scheme emphasizes? Guys, it emphasizes that you're being marked on your language devices. You're being marked on your vocabulary. You're being marked on your structure. You're being marked on your punctuation. You're being marked on your spelling. You're not being marked whether or not your character is unique. You're not being marked on how exciting your plot is. You're being marked on the command of your language and you have to understand that. Because if you don't understand that, everything else is going to fall apart. Because you're going to try to think of some crazy plot in your story and you won't have time for this. So guys, this is the mark scheme that we are all marked upon. And this mark scheme, guys, applies to whether or not we're doing the description. It applies to the story. It applies to paper two, question five. It applies to our speech, our letter, our article, our blog. It's the same exact mark scheme. 40 marks, 50% of the GCSE. What are you being marked upon? You're being marked upon how well you can use language in your writing. The other 50%, Question one, question two, question three, question four. What did that mark us on? That marked us on our use on how we analyze language. Now we're being marked upon how we use language. Now, just in case there's people that are doubting or still not convinced, let's go over some model answers that were published by the exam board. Here is the famous, famous, famous story, guys, that was published by AQA. Now, this story was given four, no, it's not 40, it was given 39 out of 40. If you add these two up, guys, it was given 39 out of 40. Now, I didn't mark that. It was published by AQA. It was published by the exam board. Now, let's have a read or a quick read of this story. Um, it's the one where the guy is waiting for the girl to text back. It says, Sven returned to his seat beneath the palm trees and chirping birds he had become acquainted with in his time beneath them. The chair itself was not the pinnacle of relaxation he had been convinced of earlier on in his life. Its creaks loudly filling the vast emptiness surrounding him. However, it was quite comfortable and his only source of relief from an otherwise disappointing, wasteful, ruthless, hopeless day. And the story continues, guys. I'm not going to read all of it. Um, you can pause the video here and read it if you want to. But the story, guys, is essentially about a man called Fen. And Fen is sitting in a chair. And while he's sitting in a chair, he's waiting for a girl, for a woman to text him back. And this woman never texts him back. And he's waiting and the text never comes. And he's waiting and the text never comes. And Fen feels abandoned. Fen feels abandoned. Basic, basic plot. Basic plot. Essentially guys, he's written or she's written a story about a guy 
who's waiting for a text back, but they never get the message coming back. Basic plot. But they gave it 39 out of 40. They gave it a grade 9. If this doesn't prove that your writing focuses more on your language than your creativity, then I don't know what will. Why did this student get a grade 9? Why did they get 39 out of 40? It's because of the following. They got 39 out of 40, guys, because their vocabulary was good, their language devices was good, their structure was good, and their punctuation was good. They were able to tick off the mark scheme. They put the examiner in a position where the examiner had no choice but to give them a grade 9. Look at this guy, by the way. This is very important. Let me zoom in for you guys. This is the key uh, that is used by the exam board to mark your work. Now, these two are not for us. They're for the examiners. So the examiner makes their comments and they give you the mark. So that, these two are not for us. And then these two, for me, are common sense. It's talking about whether you've answered the question and whether you've written for the right audience. Look at the five, well, even six, spelling. I don't pick spelling, guys, because again, we know this. You spell properly in your exam. You try your best to spell properly. Nobody walks into an English exam thinking, yeah, I'll just make spelling mistakes. But then look at the five things they picked out. They haven't written creativity as one of them. What are the five things that they have told examiners to mark your work for? They have told examiners, check if they've got good vocabulary, check their language devices, check their structure, check their sentence, sentence forms and check their punctuation. Now, before we begin and move forward in our exam, I hope everyone understands crystal clear what we are up against. We are doing an English language exam that is marking the quality of our language. Done. This is proof behind me on the board that you don't have to write the most crazy plot. A simple plot allows you to do this. And by the way, guys, um, the reason a basic plot is better is because I've seen this honestly, all the time. And I'm sure you guys have as well. Those students who think of really big plots and crazy ideas, what do they do in the exam? They write so much and they write so fast because their mind is consumed with the idea that I have to finish my story. They're not even thinking about vocabulary and language and structure. All they're thinking about is let me finish my story because it's massive. A basic plot allows you to calm yourself down. It allows you to be an artist and paint your canvas. It allows you to spend time and think about the crafting of your language devices and the vocabulary and the punctuation and the structure that you are going to use. So this is so far everything that we need to know when it comes to paper one, question number five. And the things that we care about, guys, is our vocabulary, is our devices, is our structure, our sentences, and our punctuation. So that means that for our exam on Monday, we need to use all of this stuff. And you may be wondering, sir, I don't even know big words. I don't even know language devices. I don't even know a wide range of punctuation. Guys, no, don't worry, I've got you covered. Let's go over these. And this is what you're gonna be using on Monday. Please copy this down guys into your books or wherever you're working. And let's go through what we're exactly going to use. Because guys, I said to you guys at the beginning of the video, I will give you everything you need and I'm gonna give you everything. So, we in our writing on Monday, we need to have ambitious words. Now, I'm not gonna stand here and say to you guys, use the word supercalifragilistic expialidocious and all that other nonsense. Why? There's a fine line between using big words and then just taking the mic. Words that sound weird, words that sound awkward. What's the trick of including big words in your writing? The trick is as follows. You think of basic adjectives that we always use. Bad, good, happy, sad. Big, small, confused, angry, lazy, and beautiful. These are basic adjectives. 
basic adjectives that we can use in any setting. And what do you do? You think of an alternative. So on Monday, learn the 10 words in blue. Rather than saying bad, say abhorrent. For good, say benevolent. For happy, say euphoric. For sad, say melancholy. For big, say gargantuan. For small, say minuscule. For confused, say paradoxical. For angry, say indignant. For lazy, say lackadaisical. And for beautiful, say mesmerizing. Done. We have our 10 words in the, in the bag. Now later in this video, when we plan a question five, I'll show you where to exactly use them. But for now, there you go guys, you've got 10 words that we're gonna use across our question five on Monday. And if for whatever reason, you don't like any of these words, that's fine. Go to www.thesaurus.com and search the word. For example, let's say you hate the word lackadaisical. Go to thesaurus.com, type in the word lazy and pick an alternative. But by Monday, have 10 words that you're gonna use in your exam. Once we've done vocabulary, then let's move on to punctuation. We have exclamation mark, question mark, brackets, colon, semicolon, and speech mark. Now there's many other pieces of punctuation that you can use, but these are the six that I say we can use in our writing comfortably. Exclamation mark is used for emphasis. I'm so happy, I'm so sad, I'm so angry, exclamation mark. A question mark is used at the end of a question. After a question mark, we don't put a full stop. A question mark acts in the place of a full stop also. Then we have brackets. Brackets is used correctly for extra information. But what does that actually mean? In your exam on Monday, use brackets for the date or the time or the name of the setting. Then guys, we have colon and semicolon. The easiest way to use a colon is use it to replace the word because. I am so angry because I can't find my keys. I'm so angry, colon, I can't find my keys. Replace the word because with a colon. And a semicolon guys, replace and. When and is connecting two clauses, replace the word and and instead use a semicolon. A lot of students say to me, sir, I use a semicolon for a list. I use a colon for a short list. When do you ever use a list in your writing? No one does that. Very, very rarely. So let's keep it real. The easiest way to use these two is this one replace because, this one replace and, and then guys, we have speech marks and that is used for dialogue when people are talking. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Chuck it in speech marks. Vocabulary done, punctuation done. Now, the next part guys, structural devices. Now guys, all of this will make more sense when I plan a response. When I plan a response, you'll see live how we're gonna use this on Monday. But then guys, we must have structural devices. So when we do our story, we're gonna have two paragraphs that are one line long. I don't care how small your writing is, I don't care how big your writing is. We're gonna all have a paragraph that is one line long and we're gonna do this twice. Then in our writing, somewhere in the entire story, we're gonna have at least two sentences that are one word in length. Last night I had pizza, full stop, amazing, exclamation mark. It was the best pizza ever. Then guys, we're gonna have a list of four. We're gonna include a list of four, we're gonna include dialogue, and we're gonna include, or try to include, a cyclical structure. These are the structural devices that we're consciously going to try and use. Zooming in, zooming out, shifting focus, these are gonna happen anyway. But these five are the ones that we're consciously going to use. And then we have language devices. Guys, then we have language devices. I've split this into two. These five over here are the easy peasy language devices that you should be able to use no matter what. Hyperbole, H-Y-P-E, is when you hype things up. This pen is the best pen in the world. Rhetorical question is a question in writing that does not require an answer. Third one, onomatopoeia, are words that describe sounds. Creak, crack, zoom. Number four, rule of three, 
A rule of three is when you have three words or phrases in a row describing one thing. For example, this room is white, spacious and beautiful. Then we have a simile. A simile is when you compare two nouns using like or as. This pen is like my wand. Done. These five language devices are the ones that we should be able to use with not much difficulty. Then on this side, I have five more language devices that we're going to use that is going to stretch our writing. We have personification. Personification, guys, is when you give a non-human human features. This pen was sitting on my hand. Number seven, sibilance. Sibilance is when you repeat the S letter or the S sound. The snake was slithering and sliding through the sand. Number eight and number nine, let's leave them for one second. Pathetic fallacy, guys, is when the weather reflects the mood. So if it's sunny outside, everyone's happy. If it's raining, everyone is sad. Now let's go to oxymoron and juxtaposition. These are the fakest language devices in the world. Why do I call them fake language devices? The amount of students that say to me, Sir, I know what an oxymoron is. Do you? Okay. Give me an example. How do we create one? Uh, black and white. Fat and skinny. If you want a grade one, if you want a grade one, that's fine. Crack on. Use those oxymorons. But what I want to teach you now is a bulletproof method of how to create an oxymoron and how to create juxtaposition. Create an oxymoron. The first thing that I would like you to do, the first thing that I would like you to do is I would like you to think of an adjective. That's the first thing. And after you thought on, of, of an adjective, I would like you to think of an opposite noun. So an adjective is a describing word and a noun is a naming word. So let's try it. Let's, 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 let's do one together. An adjective. I'll do the adjective small. So small is my adjective. Now, what's the opposite of small? The opposite of small is big. Now, what's the name of something that is really, really big? A scraper. I'll make that into my, as my noun. So, so small skyscraper, when it comes together, it becomes an oxymoron. Let's do one more. Let's do the adjective ugly. And what's the opposite of ugly? It is the word beautiful. Now, what is really beautiful? Let's go for princess. And then I add these two words together, the way I add these two words together. And that is how I create my oxymoron. Small skyscraper, ugly princess. And how do you turn an oxymoron into juxtaposition? All you do, guys, is you explain the oxymoron. An oxymoron is two opposing words. Juxtaposition is two opposing ideas. So, for example, ugly princess. To turn ugly princess into a juxtaposition, all I will do is as follows. The ugly princess rose from her bed and wiped the sweat from her moustache. She then slowly walked towards the bathroom, picking her bogies every step of the way. Upon arriving at the bathroom, she did two or three farts, took a poo and, I don't know, began shaving the beard from her face. I've now changed the oxymoron ugly princess and by explaining how I've transformed the oxymoron two words into two opposing ideas. Now guys, what you see on the board, it is what you need to have. We went over the mark scheme. The mark scheme spoke about language devices. It spoke about structure. It spoke about punctuation. It spoke about vocabulary. I'm giving it to you on a plate behind me. Take it and use it in your exam. If you don't want to use these, fine. Take out a few and add your own. But by the end of it, you need to have 10 language devices as a minimum, five pieces of punctuation as a minimum, and 10 language devices and five pieces of punctuation. You'll know why when we begin planning. So, now that we've got everything we need for our exam, 
Now it's time to put this into a plan. This is how you put all of that into a plan. We are doing paper one, question five. There are a few points I want to address. Whether you're describing the picture or whether you're writing the story, it doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? The mark scheme is exactly the same. All of us, regardless of the question we do on the day, all of us are aiming to do five main paragraphs. And in between paragraph one and paragraph two, we're gonna have a paragraph that is one line long. And in between paragraph three and paragraph four, we're gonna have a paragraph that is one line long. So in total, we're doing seven paragraphs, but two of these paragraphs are one line long, regardless of whether you're doing the picture and regardless of whether you're doing the story. Then in the paragraphs, guys, we have two language devices per paragraph. Those were taken from the uh, plan on the previous page. Then we have one piece of punctuation per paragraph. And then we have two ambitious words per paragraph. And then for structure, we have a one word sentence in paragraph two. In paragraph three, we're gonna have a list of four and another one word sentence. In paragraph four, we're gonna have dialogue. And in paragraph five, we will be having a cyclical structure. Now guys, just one thing that I wanna change is this. Because we're gonna have, guys, because we're gonna have dialogue in paragraph four, I'm gonna put my speech marks here and I'm gonna put my semicolon in that last paragraph there. And that is how you use all of this in a, in a real life story. This is what we're gonna do on the day of your exam. Five paragraphs, two one-line paragraphs, and each paragraph hits the mark scheme. Because remember the mark scheme, guys, it said your work must be sustained. You must keep it up throughout. So we must use all of this in our writing. Now, just a few things that I must talk about. Number one, it doesn't matter whether you're doing the description or the story, same exact structure. Number two, do you pre-plan a story what do you do when it comes to this question? Now guys, look, this is my advice when it comes to question number five. As a minimum, as a minimum, learn this off by heart. So you should know going into your exam on Monday, in paragraph one, I'm gonna use simile, gargantuan, this piece of punctuation. In paragraph two, I will use this, this, this. In paragraph three, I will use this, this, and this. Everyone should do that. You don't have to use these, you can use your own. But everyone should know going into their exams, what are their 10 words, 10 language devices, five pieces of punctuation, and five structural devices that they're gonna use in their essay. So as a minimum, learn this bottom part off by heart. Then, I would argue there is nothing wrong with pre-planning a question five. Why is that? If your question five fits on the day of your exam, fantastic, lovely days, write it out. If it doesn't fit, then do what you're gonna do anyway. Do what every other kid is doing. Work on the spot, hustle, and write a question five. But it's always better to have a couple of plots, a, club, a couple of ideas in your head that you can tweak and fit the question. And then there's this big, I, I hear it a lot, Oh, sir, my teacher told me don't pre-plan a question five because the exam board don't like it. I'm sorry, but is the exam board going to come knocking on your door and say, excuse me, did you pre-plan this or did you write this on the day? How are they going to know whether you pre-planned it or not? It doesn't make sense. So let's keep it real and let's look at the exam for what it is. Number one, this bottom part, description or story, use it. Number two, do you pre-plan a plot or not? My advice is you have zero to lose by pre-planning a plot. Personally, I would plan two or three different plots that you can fit. Why? Because you can simply tweak them on the day of your exam and make them fit the question. And if they don't fit, then you do what you were doing anyway. You simply answer the question off the cuff, but as a minimum, you have this part learned off by heart. Now, some of the pre-planned plots that I use, guys, I've had the Amazon package. 
I've had the I've had the Netflix story. I've had Priest One, Priest Two, and I've got the Bulla one about the guy driving the car. I've got loads of different plots that I can tweak to fit on the day of your exam. My advice would be, guys, think of a few. Have a few different ideas. So, for example, in my Netflix one, paragraph one, she's watching the TV show. Paragraph two, the intruders came into her house. Paragraph three, she rings her parents, nobody answers. Paragraph four, she decides to defend her home. And paragraph five, does she, does she beat the intruders? Is it a surprise party? You decide how it ends. But guys, I beg you, have a couple of plots that you know, okay, on the day of my exam, if it says, write a story about the happiest day of my life, all I'm gonna do is change a little bit over here, change a little bit over here, and make my idea fit the question. That's all you're doing. And I'm begging you guys, it will save you a lot of time. You're only playing with 45 minutes. The question five is so broad, so broad guys, the question fives are. I remember guys, when I used to be an examiner, there were times when the examiners couldn't even tell whether they were marking a descriptive piece for the picture or a story. Who cares? They had to mark it against the mark scheme. If the kid had vocabulary, language devices, punctuation and structure, they got the marks. Remember guys, the question five is so broad. In English, there is no higher. In English, there is no foundation. So all you do guys, guys, all you do is you think of an idea and you use it in your exam. Now, I was tempted to write out the opening of a question five, but my concern is that if I write out an opening paragraph, a lot of you guys are gonna just copy and paste exactly what I've written and use it in your exam. Now that is not on and I can't allow you guys to do that. So guys, my final advice for you guys in this video is as follows. 100,000% make sure you learn the bottom part, the language of your exam off by heart. Learn 10 language devices that you're gonna use. Learn five pieces of punctuation, learn 10 ambitious words, and learn your structural devices. Honestly, I've done that work for you. This is there on a platter for you to use. And no, please don't say, is it plagiarism if I use it? It's a bloody simile. It's a hyperbole. They're language devices. What you do with them is entirely up to you. So this part, use it all day long, regardless of the question five that you do. And then when it comes to what you write about, think of a couple of different ideas and make them fit on the day of your exam. And if you can't make them fit on the day of your exam, then all think of a plot on the day and you apply the language to your content. But remember, 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 this is what is important, not this. That student, remember, who got 39 out of 40, didn't get 39 out of 40 because their plot was amazing. They got 39 out of 40 because this was amazing. So focus on your language devices, focus on your vocabulary, focus on your punctuation, and focus on your structure because that is what the mark scheme demands of us. Now, for those of you revising over the next couple of days, this is my advice to you guys. This question is half of your GCSE for paper one. What I would do is this, create a plan like this. Whether you use exactly word for word what I've written or create your own with other language devices and other words, but create a plan like this. Then think of three or four different story ideas three or four different plots and then go through past papers and try to write out that plot with this language in 45 minutes see if you can apply see if you can apply it and see how it works and that should be your revision and your focus is looking at how well you use this stuff guys today is thursday if you can do one today one on friday one on saturday and one on Sunday, four times before Monday. When you enter your exam on Monday and you turn to your question five, it should feel like just another question because you've done it so much. All right, guys, I genuinely hope you found this video beneficial because the whole purpose, guys, of this video is to make sure you're able to smash question number five. I hope you're more confident, I hope you're more secure, and I hope you're more lasered in on what is required of you on the day. 
You use what I've given you and make it 10,000 times better. There's some of you out there who know way more than 10 language devices. If you know 15 language devices, then use three per paragraph. It's the day of an exam. You want to show off. You want to give the examiner everything you got. So guys, good luck with your question five. Go and smash it. And as always, thank you for the support. It's been Mr. Everything English.